Well, I want to thank you for being back and joining us for what is week three of the Wisdom Series. So far, we've talked about wisdom for friendship. We've talked about wisdom for motherhood. And today, we're kind of shifting gears a little bit, and we're going to talk about wisdom for sexual purity. So everybody grab a copy of God's Word and turn to the book of Proverbs. We're going to be in Proverbs chapter 7 today. I want to encourage you to follow along in God's Word. I believe He has a word for all of us. You know, we all know very many well-known people and personalities that have absolutely ruined their lives, that have ruined their families, that have ruined even their careers because of sexual sin. I mean, it doesn't take a very long time at all to come up with a list of people that we've heard about in the tabloids, people like Bill Cosby or Matt Lauer, people like Charlie Sheen or even Jared from the Subway commercials, right? I mean, it doesn't take a very long to come up with a short list. And the fact of the matter is, each one of these stories, each one of these people had, had, the, same, had the same thing happen. And that is one thing happened after another thing, and another thing happened after another thing, and before you knew it, everything in their life has changed. You know, many religious leaders and professing Christ followers have also experienced that same kind of self-destruction. I'm talking about pastors. I'm talking about denominational leaders, ministry workers. This is something that affects Christian men and Christian women. They've fallen out of ministry and become disqualified from their own office. And the reason is because of sexual sin. Sexual immorality is something that's affecting the men in our country, the women in our country, and believe it or not, even the teenagers in our country. And research is showing very clearly that the majority of sexual sin actually stems from and roots from pornography. In fact, today in America, over 40 million adults are considered frequent visitors to pornographic websites. The latest statistics actually show that 18% of Christian men, 18% of us view pornography at least once a week. 64% of American men across the board view pornography multiple times a month. And it's not just the men who are affected by this thing called pornography. In fact, if you look at that same report, it shows that one in three visitors to adult websites right now are women. In fact, it says 17% of American women are are addicted to pornography. And I wish we could stop there, but we can't. It's sad to say that these statistics not only affect the men and the women in our country, but now they're impacting our children. This report that I read said that our children aged 8 to 16, out of all the children in America that fall in those those years, 90% of them have viewed pornography online this year. I'm going to say that again. 90% of our children age 8 to 16 are looking at pornography online. And I know you hear that the same way I hear it, and you think, man, that sounds crazy. It sounds absolutely impossible. But the truth is, those are the facts. And the devil loves to use sexual sin to destroy God's children. It doesn't matter how old you are, that applies to you. The devil loves to use sexual sin to destroy God's children. We act like this is a new thing, but really, the same thing was happening in Solomon's day. In fact, in Proverbs chapter 7, you see him begin by acknowledging this very same thing. The fact is, he begins by giving us a word of warning, and the word of warning that was written in that day still applies to today. Verse 1 begins by saying, "'My son, obey my words and treasure my commands.'" Now, I want you to see from the very beginning here, he's talking about the commands of God. Remember, Solomon asked God for wisdom, and God granted his request, making him the wisest man to ever live. Therefore, in this conversation, Solomon is sharing with God's children God's wisdom. And he's saying, you can either take the path of foolishness, or you can take the path of wisdom. But if you're going to be wise, you need to obey my words. He goes on in verse 2 to tell us what those words are. He says, keep my commands and live. And guard my instructions as you would the pupil of your eye. Tie them to your fingers. Write them on the tablet of your heart. Say to wisdom, you are my sister, and call understanding your relative. She will keep you from a forbidden woman, a wayward woman with her flattering talk. So here's what Solomon just said. He said, even though temptation is great, wisdom can save you from yourself. 
This is a good word for all of us. Even though temptation in your life is great, wisdom can save you from yourself. You see that? He's talking about all the temptation, all the demonic traps, all the enticing that was taking place, and he's saying, if you will pursue wisdom, check this out, you'll be okay. If you'll pursue wisdom, you'll be okay. In this passage, it's like Solomon's pulling us aside and he's saying, hey, guess what? You personally don't have what it takes to live. You personally, in and of yourself, you don't have what is necessary to survive. But he goes on to say, however, keep my commands and you'll live. So hopefully this morning you're taking notes. I really want to encourage you to take notes. In fact, if the person next to you isn't taking notes, tell them you need to be taking notes. I'm going to give you four things from this chapter that you need to remember and you need to share. The first thing I want you to see is this. Sexual purity begins with knowing God's word. That's what it says. He said, you've got to know the word of God. He said, keep my commands and live. But in order to keep his commands, first of all, you have to know his commands. In verse 1 and 2, Solomon breaks this down into three simple parts, and he makes it seem pretty easy. He said, first of all, pay attention to wisdom. Second of all, know God's word. Third of all, obey God's word. Do you get that? Really simple outline. Pay attention to wisdom, know the word of God, and obey the word of God. And he says, if you do those things, guess what? You'll live. Then he goes on in the following verses to take it to another level. And he's going to tell us, you need to saturate your heart and saturate your mind in the Word of God. You need to be saturated completely. And when you do that, you need to treat wisdom like wisdom is family. Read those words. Verse 4, Say to wisdom, you are my sister, and call understanding your relative. She will keep you from a forbidden woman, a wayward woman, with her flattering talk. He describes God's wisdom in this passage as if it's the margin on a piece of paper. He's talking about God's wisdom and God's word as you and I would describe the shoulder on the side of the road. And he's saying there's going to be those moments in your life when things get a little bit crazy. Temptation is all over you. And in that moment, if you have the word of God in your heart, if you have the word of God in your mind, it's going to be like the shoulder on the side of the highway and it'll prevent you from driving off the cliff. But if you don't have God's word in your heart, if you're not obeying the commands of God, you don't have that same buffer that believers have in their life. The psalmist talks about the same thing in Psalm 119, verse 11. He said, I have hidden your word in my heart so that I may not sin against you. In verse 9, in that same chapter, he asked this question. He said, how can a young man keep his way pure? And then he goes on to answer the question and said this, by keeping your word. So basically, if you want to live, and if you want to live your life in a pure way, the way that God called you to live, he said, it begins by knowing the word of God. Now, secondly, sexual purity also results from fleeing temptation. And we see Solomon talk about that here in Proverbs chapter 7. He goes on in verse 6 to tell a story, and this is what he said. At the window of my house, I looked through my lattice. I saw among the inexperienced, I noticed among the youths, a young man lacking sense. Crossing the street near her corner, he strolled down the road to her house at twilight, in the evening, in the dark of the night. A woman came to meet him dressed like a prostitute, having a hidden agenda. Now, buckle up for just a second because Solomon's getting a little PG-13, all right? But, but he's, he's, got, he's got your attention, and I think he's got mine as well. And here's the picture that he's given us. Solomon is basically creeping on this guy. And he's creeping on him by looking out of his window, and he's watching this young man out, the, out of his window, and he's saying, this boy is in trouble. Now, why does he say he's in trouble? He's going to say it for three different reasons in this text. He tells you, first of all, I can tell he's in trouble because he is lacking sense. That's what the word says, a young man lacking sense sense. Now, let me ask you a question. Have you ever met a young man that didn't lack sense? I mean, ever? I read somewhere not too long ago that the average male brain doesn't fully function or develop until the age of 25. I think for me, it was closer to the age of 30. Uh, but, But the fact of the matter is, when we're young, 
We tend to make mistakes. Why? Because the Bible says we lack sense. And that's exactly what Solomon said. This boy's in trouble, and I can tell because he's lacking sense. The second reason you can tell he's in trouble is because he was in a place he shouldn't have been. He was in a place that he shouldn't have been. The Bible says the street near her corner. Near whose corner? The prostitute's corner. And when was he hanging out on the prostitute's corner? The Bible says while she was working. In fact, it says at twilight in the evening in the dark of the night. So this young man's in trouble for several different reasons. Number one, because he's lacking sense. Number two, because he's in a place that he shouldn't have been. But number three, he's in trouble because he was moving towards something that he should have been walking away from. He was moving towards something that he should have been running away from. I grew up my entire life hearing my parents say these words. They said, son, if you play with fire, you're going to get burned. You had the same parents I did. But I've heard it a million different times in a million different ways. Son, if you keep moving towards the snake, sooner or later, you're going to get, you're going to get bit. It's common sense. And that's the exact same story that Solomon's telling in this passage. He's saying, this is a young man that lacks sense. He's in a place that he shouldn't be, and he's moving towards something that he should be moving away from. It's consistent with what God's word tells us over and over again throughout the pages of Scripture. You go to 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 18. God says clearly, flee sexual immorality. He says flee. He never says you ought to play around with sexual immorality. He never says you should move towards sexual immorality. He never says you should flirt with sexual immorality. 100% of the time, God says run away from sexual immorality. Run away from the temptation to give in to sexual sin. Somebody hears that and they say, well, I can't just run away every time I'm tempted to sin. I mean, I can't literally run away every time I'm tempted to do something I shouldn't be doing. Well, listen, you may not literally run away, but you need to do something. You need to do something. It was Martin Luther that said, you can't keep the birds from flying over your head, but you can keep them from building a nest in your hair. You can do something. And the fact of the matter is there are certain settings that are too tempting. There are certain conversations that are too intimate. There are certain touches that are too personal. There are certain liberties that we take that are way out of bounds. And the Bible says that we are fools if we flirt with these things. 1 Corinthians 6.18 says, flee sexual immorality. Every other sin a person commits is outside the body, but the person who is sexually immoral sins against his own body. Don't you know that your body is a temple of the Holy Spirit who is in you, whom you have from God? You are not your own, for you were bought at a price. So glorify God with your body. The Bible says sexual purity begins with knowing God's word, and it results from fleeing temptation. But can I give you a third thing to consider today? Sexual purity is strengthened by considering consequences. It's strengthened by considering consequences. Some of the time, sometimes the, the wisest thing that we can do is to just take a time out in life. Sometimes the wisest thing we can do is just to stop and to consider the consequences of our actions. The Bible tells us in Hebrews eleven twenty five that there is pleasure in sin. The Bible never says that it, it, there is no pleasure in sin. In fact, it says it very clearly. It says sin is fun for a season. And we recognize that. I don't have to convince you of that. But many times what we fail to recognize is what we read in Galatians 6, 7, where it says that sin will also always lead to consequences. Read that with me if you would. It says, don't be deceived. God is not mocked. For whatever a person sows, he will also reap, because the one who sows to his flesh will reap destruction from the flesh. It says you can give in to sin. It may be fun for a season, but ultimately you're going to reap what you sow. I read that this week and I thought about an article I came across not too long ago in National Geographic. It was a fascinating article about a 13-foot snake, a Burmese python, that decided it would be a good idea to swallow a six-foot alligator in Florida. I don't know if you saw this article, blew my mind. I was like, wow, that is a big snake. 
that made a big decision. And you know, I saw that picture and I ended up watching the video. I definitely don't recommend the video on YouTube, but you should check it out. It's a great video. Uh, but I'm, I'm thinking this snake probably at one point thought, this is a great decision. Like I'm starving. I have desires, I have needs, I'm hungry, and this is a huge meal. Like, I should, I should not just take a bite of this alligator, I should swallow a six-foot alligator. That sounds like a great idea. I'm sure the Burmese python was slapping high fives with other Burmese pythons, and he was thinking, this is a great decision that I'm making right now. But you know what? As you continue to hear the story play out, this is what happened. Once the alligator was completely inside of the snake... The alligator decided to do what is called a death roll. And it started contorting its body over and over again inside of the snake to the point where at one point it burst out of the snake, blowing the snake up in two pieces. The alligator walks away on all four legs while the, while the snake is left dead. At first, I'm sure it sounded like a great decision, but you know what? That little decision ended up costing the snake its life because it was destroyed from the inside out. Remember this story, because it's the picture of sin. You get it? It's the picture of sin. The pleasure of sin is temporary, but the consequences of sin are forever. God's word says the same thing about us. He says, our sin is that very same story. Because there's a lot of times we think about our own sin, our personal sin, we say, man, it's not that big of a deal. It's not that big of a deal. It's a small sin. It's a tiny sin. It's not hurting anybody. It's a secret. There's no destruction taking place. And we believe that lie until finally we look up one day and that tiny little sin inside of us destroys us from the inside out. The Bible says the same thing in verse 21. Read it. It says, she seduces him with her persistent pleading. She lures with her flattering talk. He follows her impulsively like an ox going to the slaughter like a deer bounding towards a trap until an arrow pierces its liver, like a bird darting into a snare. Check this part out. He doesn't know it will cost him his life. Someone once said, sin will take you farther than you want to go. It'll keep you longer than you want to stay. And it'll cost you more than you want to pay. That's what sin is. That's exactly what Solomon is saying in this warning. He's saying, listen, sexual sin will cost you someday in some way. He's saying your sexual sin will find you out even if you think you're getting away with it. And what that tells us here in today is that you're not going to get away with what you think you're going to get away with. You're not going to get away with a sexual affair or an emotional affair. You're not going to get away with an inappropriate relationship or an addiction to pornography that nobody knows about. You're not going to get away with cohabitating and, and living with someone and sleeping with someone before the covenant of marriage is established. You're not going to get away with that. However, we live in a culture that says, I can get away with this. This is a tiny sin. It's not hurting anybody. But the Bible says, guess what? It's going to happen. Don't lack sense is what Solomon's saying. Your day is coming. I want you to notice in this text, when Solomon is referring to our temptation and our sin, he draws a parallel to this young, naive man that's falling into temptation. He's talking about how he was focused on this woman's deceitful persuasion, and then Solomon compares that process that we go through to three different images in the scripture. The first one is an ox going to the slaughter. The second one is a deer running towards a trap. And the third one is a bird darting into a snare. He's saying in each of these situations, they may have hesitated at first, but eventually they ended up getting involved in whatever it was that was tempting them. And the result was bad. Have you ever seen an ox go to be slaughtered? Better yet, have you ever seen a cow be slaughtered? Anyone here today? You ever seen that happen? I have. And it was horrible. And I was just watching a YouTube video, right? It was really bad. And I think I was even eating a cheeseburger at the time watching it. And I was still like, oh, this is really sad, right? It's really sad. Have you ever seen an animal stuck in a trap? Have you ever seen a bird stuck in a snare, unable to fly away? I believe Solomon gave us this imagery on purpose. I believe he wanted us to relate to the sad imagery 
that's in this text. Because guess what? When someone gives into temptation, it's sad. I've watched close personal friends in ministry fall into sexual sin. I'm talking about people that God is using in incredible ways just give in to the temptation that the devil puts in front of them. And let me just tell you, it is absolutely heartbreaking. I've had conversations with close friends after the fact and just said, how, man? How would that happen to you? Why would that happen to you? And I'll never forget a close friend about two years ago looked at me and said, well, Jordan, here's the thing. I just never thought the consequences were going to come. Here's what Solomon's telling all of us today in Proverbs chapter seven. He's saying, if you continue sinning, the consequences are coming. If you make the decision that I'm gonna continue down this path, there is a day that's coming where those consequences are going to arrive. And he tells us over and over again, the consequences are going to be greater than you expect. They will be physical and mental and emotional and personal. They will be professional. They will be relational. They will be spiritual. The consequences of your sin are going to be greater than you expect. I like how Bruce Waltke put it. He said, stupid animals see no connection between traps and death. And morally stupid people see no connection between their sin and death. One of my mentors told me hundreds of times, Jordan, you are always one decision away from stupid. And that applies to all of us today. But the question I have is, how do we avoid that moment? How do we avoid that decision? You know what Solomon will tell us? He'll say it starts by knowing God's word and obeying God's word and fleeing temptation and considering the consequences for your actions. But he gives us one more little nugget of truth here in chapter seven, and I want you to get this. He says, sexual purity is made possible by guarding your heart, by guarding your your heart. Read that in verse 24. Now, sons, listen to me and pay attention to the words from my mouth. Don't let your heart turn aside to her ways. Don't stray onto her paths, for she has brought many down to death. Her victims are countless. Her house is the road to Sheol, descending to the chambers of death. If you're a note taker and you like outlines, this is a great time to pick up the pen because Solomon gives us three action points in three different verses here. In verse 25, he says, guard your heart. In verse 26, he says, guard your body. And in verse 27, he says, guard your future. That's the outline for these three words or these three verses. And then he goes on to say that this seductive woman who really represents all temptation to all sin is the road that leads to death and hell. And that's an interesting description because he compares it to a road that we all travel, a sinful journey that we all take, a pathway that leads to death and destruction. And he said, if you're not careful, you'll get on this path. And once you're on, it's hard to get off the path. Theologian Alan Ross said, a man's life is not destroyed in one instant. It is taken from him gradually as he enters into a course of life that will leave him as another victim of the wages of sin. Now, you know those words. They came from Romans 6, 23. It says, for the wages of sin is death. But thankfully, that verse continues on to say, but the gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus, our Lord. Do you understand what that means today? It means that right now, if you're on the sinful road that leads to death and destruction and hell, you can acknowledge the fact that you're on the wrong road. And you have the ability in this moment to take the next exit, to do a U-turn, and to begin a journey with Jesus Christ today, fully redeemed and restored as a brand new creation in Jesus Christ. You don't have to continue to live in sin. That's what the Bible says. It says, because of Jesus, you and I, sinful people, we have another option if we're willing to take it. Ephesians 4.22, it talks about it. It said, you can take off your former way of life, the old self that's corrupted by deceitful desires, to be renewed in the spirit of your minds and to put on the new self, the one created according to God's likeness in righteousness and purity of the truth. The word says when we're saved, our old sinful self dies. You get that. 
This isn't like God wants to make you a better version of who you used to be. This is like God saying the old you was terrible. I'm killing that person and I'm going to create a brand new creation in Christ built on my righteousness and who I am. Your righteousness isn't built off of you and all the great decisions that you're able to make. Your righteousness is only found in the person of Jesus Christ, and that's what he's saying. We become the righteousness of God, and we don't have to live the life that we once lived. You get to Romans 6.1, and he asks a great question. He said, well, then should we continue in sin? Should we continue in sin so that grace may multiply? But then he goes on to answer his own question, and he says these words, absolutely not. Absolutely not. How can we who died to sin still live in it? How can we who died to sin still live in it? You know what that verse tells me? If you are in Christ today, you have the ability to avoid sin. If you know Jesus, listen to me, you have everything you need to stiff arm sin and continue to pursue Jesus with reckless abandon. I mean, that's what this verse says. It says, the power of Christ in me is greater than the temptation that entices me. I'm going to say it again. The power of Christ in me is greater than the temptation that entices me. In fact, I'm going to say it, and then I want you to repeat it, because you need to remember this one today. Ready? The power of Christ in me. Say it again. The power of Christ in me is greater than the temptation that entices me. Let's say it again. The power of Christ in me is greater than the the, the (laughs) temptation that entices me. (laughs) Listen, words are hard sometimes, y'all. But the truth of the matter is the word is the same. And the word doesn't change. And the word says that the God who changed life 2,000 years ago is the same God who gives us the power to fight temptation today. What we're talking about today is relevant. It is relevant, is it not? Let's not act like we're holier than thou and this isn't something that has affected us or our marriages or our families or our kids or our culture. Listen, this right here is one of the devil's favorite tools. It's one of his favorite toys. And it's not time for the church to act like we're holier than thou. It's time for the church to hit our knees and to be reminded that we in and of ourselves don't have what it takes to combat the enemy's attacks. He is powerful and he is nasty. The Bible says he's the most beautiful creation, the most powerful creation that was ever created. And the only way that you and I can stand up against his attacks is to understand that we are empowered by the Holy Spirit and he lives in us and the power of Christ in me is greater than the the temptation that entices me. We have to believe that today or we're gonna live in darkness. The only way to go from the darkness into the light is to submit our lives to the one who is the light. And that is Jesus Christ. You know, it breaks my heart to see people falling over and over again. People who have forgotten the power of God. But today my prayer is that if you don't know him, you'll find the power today. And that if you have a personal relationship with him today, then you will remember how big and powerful he truly is. And that you'll remember that when you find yourself in your struggle. That you'll hide his word in your heart. So that he can be the margin on the piece of paper. He can be the shoulder on the side of the the road. He can give you the buffer you need as you try to fight the devil's attacks because he wants to take you down today. He wants to take your family down. And we need him today. Amen? We need, I, I need him in my life. I need him in my family. We need him in our country. We need him in our church. And may we continue to be reminded of how good he really is. As we've just explored, sexual purity is a very real attack that affects all of us. But you're not alone in those moments of temptation and heartache. It's important that we hold close to God's word and continue to move towards what is right and what is pure. Right now, you have the opportunity by the grace of God to overcome whatever you're facing and you can turn to Jesus. Let me ask you something. Is God stirring in your heart at this moment? Did you know you can confess your sin, accept Jesus and make him first in your life today? Let me ask you, have you done that? We'd love to hear from you if you have. Let us know if this broadcast is making a difference in your life and by connecting with us and letting us know what Jesus is doing in your heart. God bless you guys. And I wanna thank you once again for joining this broadcast today. Tune in next week as we continue the wisdom series and open God's word once again. God bless.